There is no more iconic image of an Australian outlaw than that of Ned Kelly. Dressed in a suit of armour, guns blazing, was standing a barrage of police gunfire at the Glen Rowan siege. To some, he was a hero who stood up for the Irish settlers oppressed by the colonial Victorian government. To others, he was just a cold-blooded killer. So come with me as today I go in search of Ned Kelly, Australia's last great outlaw and one of Australia's greatest cultural icons. The story of Edward Ned Kelly is a tale of oppression, power and violence in the new colony of Victoria. It spawned books, artworks and multiple movies. Heath Ledger played Ned in 2003. Mick Jagger even had a go in 1970. And even the world's first full-length feature film was The Story of the Kelly Gang in 1906. Clearly this story has captured the imagination of Australians for a very long time. So today we're going to head on the Ned Kelly trail and we're going to discover, was he really a hero or a villain? Kelly's story starts here in Beveridge, a small town about an hour north of Melbourne. Kelly was born in December 1854 into a, an impoverished Irish family. His father, John Red Kelly, built this house here and they lived there with his mother Ellen and eight children. And Kelly went to school at the nearby Catholic Church Primary School. But life was tough here as they tried to eke out an existence in this small plot of land and that wasn't helped by Red Kelly's growing alcoholism. By the time Ned was 12, his father had died and Ned now became the head of the household. So the Kellys struggled and desperate people sometimes do desperate things. When Ned was just 15, his mother Ellen struck up a friendship with the notorious local outlaw Harry Powell who took young Ned under his wing and taught him all the skills of bush ranging. Harry Powell set up a permanent camp up here in what's now called Powell's Lookout. He had a great view of the valley and the track that ran through it. So any travelers or stagecoaches, he could see them coming for miles, get down there and rob them. And Ned was alongside him learning all the time. This is the main lookout here, and uh, it's kind of a bit tricky to get to, but they've actually got a path here. There's a stair here, and you can see it follows the cliff face and goes back up to the top. Yeah, I'm still a man who doesn't like heights, but this feels pretty safe. So I think you'll be okay coming here, even with kids. So Harry Powell had a permanent camp up here with Ned and you can see why he had such a great view of the whole valley. Wow, 
it's uh, pretty spectacular. Of the two lookouts, definitely lookout number one is the most spectacular. A little bit harder to get to, but it's not too bad. Now, 15-year-old Neb was definitely no angel. In 1869, he was arrested for robbery and assault, but he got off that charge. But that was just the first of many altercations with police. Soon, he spent six months in jail for assault, and then when he was released, he borrowed a horse from a friend, except the friend forgot to tell him the horse was stolen. So when Neb was stopped by police, he was charged with receiving a stolen horse and spent another three months in Pentridge Prison. So Neb was well and truly on his way to becoming a troublesome young man. And according to one local newspaper, he was well becoming an enemy of society. After his second stint in prison, Ned tried to live like an honest man. He got work as a timber feller and also as a builder. But in 1878, an event occurred that changed his life forever and sent him on a path of no return to becoming Australia's most notorious outlaw. That event involved young police officer, Constable Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick arrived at the Kellys household to arrest Dan for horse stealing. He apparently was quite drunk at the time and uh, he made a pass at Ned's sister Kate and uh, so there was a bit of a scuffle that ensued between Dan and Fitzpatrick and even Ellen, Fit Ellen um, Kelly used a coal shovel to whack him on the head with and somehow during that, that scuffle Fitzpatrick shot himself in the wrist. So when he went back to the police station and the other officers saw the state of him, they said, what happened? And he said, Ned Kelly shot me. Kelly claimed he wasn't even there. He said Fitzpatrick was drunk and he didn't even have a warrant for anybody's arrest. It was decided Fitzpatrick was, really wasn't much of a witness, didn't have a lot of credibility and was also described as a disgrace to the police force. It was noted that when he returned to the police station and made his accusations, the other officers realized he smelt like alcohol. But even so, the charges stood. So Ellen Kelly was found guilty of assault and sent to Pentridge for three years. And Ned and Dan decided this best course of action was to go on the run with them both being charged with attempted murder of a policeman. So Ned and Dan took to the bush with their friends Steve Hart and Joe Byrne and that's when the famous Kelly Gang was formed. Here at Stringy Bark Creek, it's a pivotal place in the story of Ned Kelly. In 1878, a party of police searching for the Kelly gang were camped here at Stringy Bark Creek. But Sergeant Kennedy and Constables Lonergan, Scanlon and McIntyre had no idea the Kelly gang were really close nearby. So when the Kellys realised the police were very nearby, they devised a plan to surprise them. Now what happened next is controversial, and it depends on whether you subscribe to the villain or hero image of Kelly. According to Kelly, they only wanted to disarm them and take away their horses. So they surprised them with guns drawn, 
and Lonergan and McIntyre were still at the camp. McIntyre surrendered peacefully, threw away his weapons, but Lonergan drew his gun and shot, and Kelly returned fire, killing Lonergan. The other two police, Kennedy and Scanlon, were on patrol, but they soon returned. The Kelly gang bailed them up and told them to drop their weapons. But Scanlon whipped out his revolver and started firing. Ned returned fire and Scanlon was shot and killed. A gunfight ensued and eventually Kennedy was also dead. During the chaos of the gunfight, McIntyre jumped on a horse and got away and alerted authorities. Ned Kelly claimed he didn't mean to shoot anybody, he was just wanting to disarm them. But once the police started firing, he had to return fire. The gang was declared outlaws and a massive £2,000 reward was put on their heads and Parliament sat and passed a law meaning that they could be caught dead or alive. Anybody could shoot Ned Kelly now and claim the reward. Kelly had friends in the bush and he managed to stay at large for months. The police couldn't catch him. He was getting help from sympathizers, family and friends. So the police decided to crack down on the friends and sympathizers. In one case, police arrested 23 men on suspicion of being sympathetic to the Kellys. They held them for one month without charge. So now Kelly supporters were starting to pay the price for supporting Kelly. But these sort of police abuses just helped for others to see the Kelly gang as one of their own, oppressed and suffering injustice. But Kelly, the hero, was now a cop killer. And that made him a serious villain. At Stringy Bark Creek, there's a memorial to the fallen policeman. After the tragedy at Stringy Bark Creek, a memorial was placed to the, to the dead policeman in Mansfield, but nothing was put here because the situation was too remote. There was one tree that had bullet marks in it, and there was another tree with the letter K for Kennedy uh, marked in it where he died. But over the years, both trees have been felled and used for timber harvesting. In the 1930s, Tim Braun selected this tree as a permanent living memorial to the slain policeman. It's called the Kelly Tree. And nearby, there's a lovely free camp area. $2.10 a litre, now that's highway robbery. Next I've come to the small town of Euroa, just outside the Strathbogie Ranges. It was here in 1878 that the Kelly gang, having hidden out for quite a number of months, was short of money. So they decided to come here and rob the bank. They netted £2,000 in gold and then escaped to the Strathbogie Ranges. A couple of months later they robbed the bank at Geraldery, netting themselves about £4,000. At the bank, Kelly found a pile of more farm mortgages. He burnt them, freeing the poor farmers of debt and declaring that the banks are the enemy of the people. 
At Gerildery, Kelly denounced the police, the Victorian government and the British Empire. Kelly claimed he was forced to become an outlaw because of Fitzpatrick's lies and constant police harassment. He demanded justice not only for his own family, but for all the poor of the Victorian colony, who he said was subjected by the tyranny of the English yoke. Kelly's 56-page letter was later published by a local newspaper. Through Kelly, the poor Irish settlers now had a voice. And Kelly's reputation as a revolutionary fighting for the oppressed poor was cemented. Kelly called for the northeast of Victoria to become a separate republic, free from police harassment and free from the Victorian government and the squatocracy that took lands away from poor Irish settlers. In response, the government upped the reward to £4,000 and then eventually £8,000. It was here at Glen Rowan that the Kelly story reached its dramatic and bloody climax. Kelly and his gang holed up at Ann Jones's Glen Rowan Inn. They took 62 hostages, men, women and children. News filtered to the police that the Kelly gang were here in Glen Rowan, so they sent out a special trainload of troopers. But Kelly got word of this and he sabotaged the track. Kelly waited almost a day and a half for the troopers to arrive. And during that time, they entertained the hostages with games and songs and dances. They had a great time. But the troopers were warned of the sabotage track and eventually arrived, taking up positions in a dry creek bed opposite the inn. It was right here that the shootout happened, one of the most dramatic events in Australia's history. So some 30 police were lined up in this embankment shooting over at the inn. So you had police here, the inn over there with 64 people and the Kelly gang inside. Bridge works weren't happening in those days so it was probably a little quieter and this is where it all happened. And the gunfight began. Now most of the hostages got out, got away at the back of the inn. There were some still inside and three were killed by police fire. By 4.30 a.m. after hundreds of volleys of police fire, Joe Byrne also lay dead inside the inn. During the night, Ned left the inn with his helmet and with his armour and he staggered to this clump of bushes here and he lay asleep. He said he could have gotten away, but he decided he needed to end it here. So by morning, Ned rose, wearing the armour, hard to move, wounded, and he saw the police encampment. There were 30 police just across the, where the road is now, and he began firing. Donning his heavy armour, it weighed 45 kilograms, he stepped out into the dark and the mist and began firing. He was met with a savage volley of police fire that left him with almost 30 wounds to his hands, arms, legs, feet, groin, Staggering forward, then eventually collapsed by a fallen log. And it was right here where Ned finally fell and was captured by police. Steve Hart, Joe Byrne and Dan Kelly lay dead inside the inn. Byrne's body was removed and hung up at the station and photographed. The other two, well, the police decided to light the inn on fire and destroy it. And so their bodies were completely decimated.
So there's nothing that remains of where that uh, famous shootout happened. It's an empty patch on a street next to Roadworks uh, in Glen Rowan. You wouldn't know it, but this is where one of the most famous events in Australia's history happened right here. Imagine the police would have been right here, behind this tree, dodging shots and returning fire across the road there, ignore the traffic lights, uh, to where the inn used to be. And people still find bullet casings and remnants of that, that uh, shootout here. In 1997, a couple of teenagers found uh, an old revolver right here. How cool would that be? You're just scratching around in the dirt and there's an old police revolver from the shootout with Ned Kelly. I assume they got to keep it. These days, the small town of Glen Rowan is the epicenter of Kelly tourism. Right behind me is a brand new multi-million dollar discovery center. There are Kelly memorabilia and tourism places right throughout this town. Kelly was captured and taken to Melbourne, the old Melbourne jail, where he went on trial in the Supreme Court in front of Judge Redmond Barry, who found him guilty of murder, and Kelly was sentenced to be hanged by the net until dead. And his final words, such is life. Kelly's remains were buried in an unmarked grave at Melbourne jail, and then when Melbourne jail closed, uh, his remains, along with all the others, were moved to a mass grave at the back of Pentridge Jail. And then when Pentridge closed, Kelly's remains were actually identified through DNA and his remains were returned to his descendants. And I believe he's buried in an unmarked grave in Greta Cemetery. And it's unmarked because that way Kelly will finally find the peace he sought. There are plenty of replicas of Ned Kelly's armour, but there's only one original, and you'll find it here in the State Library of Victoria. And this is the original Ned Kelly armour. You can see, still see dents in the armour from the bullets. Wow. So what do I think of it all? I'm no expert. There are people who have studied Ned Kelly for years and years and years. But here's what I think. I think he was pushed into being a criminal. I think the police harassment pushed him further and further over the edge into a criminal world. There was good inside Ned Kelly. He, when he was 11 years old, he leapt into a river and saved a young boy from drowning. And he definitely was close to his family and his community, and his community was suffering. And he resented that. And so he became something of a voice for the community that was oppressed and suffered injustice, just like he did. So for that, definitely, he was a hero. But here's the thing, he killed three policemen, and here at Glen Rowan, while he was waiting for the train to arrive, he could have taken off anyway. He had a day and a half where he could have gone anywhere, 
an escape, but he clearly wanted to have that confrontation, one last shootout with the police. And if the train had derailed like he planned, then 30 policemen would, would have been dead. It, it was a, a final shootout between him and the bitter enemy, the police. At that point, I think he had a hatred of police and that's what drove him. So he was a killer. That makes him a villain as well. So that's Ned Kelly. People have argued over Ned Kelly for years and they'll continue to argue over Ned Kelly. Such is life. What's your comments? What do you think? Put something down in the comments below, but please keep it respectful. Until the next time, see ya.